Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and it's Friday, May 13th. I thought I'd use today to kind of summarize what's going on on the Fukushima site and immediately off-site. But a quick summary would be that basically if this were an American rodeo, the bucking broncos would have been throwing the cowboys all week long. There's a meeting on, uh, on, on Thursday where the NRC is being briefed by, the, uh, by, the, by its staff. And I think that what the uh, staff is going to tell them is that the situation is still unstable. Um, I think unstable is, um, is an understatement. Today on Unit 1, TEPCO announced that the, um, uh, that the reactor core was uncovered and that significant fuel had been damaged. And um, I don't think that should come to as a surprise to, uh, to any of you, but, um, but it was a, a news press release from TEPCO. And uh, they discovered this because they were able to get people into the containment for a very brief amount of time who could put new gauges in. Um, the new gauges indicated that there's um, no water in the reactor and very little in the containment. Well, that brings up the question, then, where did all that water go? And we put in tens of thousands of tons of water over the last, uh, over the last two months now. And uh, that's an indication that, um, the, that, there's, that there's leaks into the groundwater, which I'll discuss a little bit later. So unit one is, uh, is dry and uh, possibly has melted through the nuclear reactor and is now lying on the floor of the nuclear containment, um, causing incredibly high exposures to the people that are trying to get in. Um, the exposures are 70 R an hour. That basically means that in four or five hours you're dead. And it's not a long-term death, it's a quick death. So it's high, high exposures to radiation in unit one. So it's time to go back and change the plan on Unit 1, and uh, I, I believe that's what TEPCO has to do. The radiation levels are just too high. Moving on to Unit 2, there's really no change there. It's leaking like a sieve. Water's being poured in the top, it's coming out a hole in the bottom, and the containment is leaking. So you've got another large source of water, and there's simply not enough room on site to, uh, to capture all this water. And the, um, the, there's obviously a need to cleanse it. And we're talking about cleansing capability beyond what's ever been tried before in the past. Um, on average, the, uh, the Fukushima units are using close to 100 tons of water a day. And um, demineralization is normally a ton or two a day. So obviously there has to be a dramatic change in the plan to clean this water up. Um, or else it's going to get released into the groundwater and it's going to get released into the, uh, into the ocean. Unit 3 is interesting. There's been um, uh, chatter on the internet about smoke coming out of Unit 3. I, I don't think that's a cause for concern. It happened at night and air gets cold at night and the uh, Pacific is very cold. Um, and I think what you're seeing is the warm steam coming out of Unit 3 hitting the cold water and producing a really thick, um, steamy smoke. Um, it's radioactive, no doubt, but it's not an indication of a fire. At least I don't think it is. That's about the only good news coming out of Unit 3, though. Uh, like I said before, the temperature at the top of the nuclear reactor is very high, but the pressure in the reactor is very low. And what that means is that water can't exist under those conditions. There's no water and there's no steam inside the Unit 3 reactor based on a high gas temperature and a low pressure. Well, what that means is there's air in there and nuclear reactors are not meant to be cooled by air. Uh, so there's still a, a real severe problem in cooling the, uh, the Unit 3 reactor. Uh, the hydrogen um, explosion is, is, is still possible at Unit 3 because of that, that wide disparity. Another thing that came out of Unit 3 this week was, uh, was a movie that they were able to take inside the fuel pool. And um, you'll recall that Unit 3 is the one that is uh, largely a pile of rubble at this point. And the fuel pool pictures were awful. 
Um, they really indicated large pieces of concrete had fallen into the pool, uh, large masses of metal were in the pool, the uh, rods, uh, the control rods and the uh, fuel racks appeared to me to be distorted. Uh, it's clearly an indication that there's been a, um, a violent um, uh, explosion inside that pool. I think the pictures confirm what I've been telling you, that uh, some sort of a violent exothermic reaction occurred inside that pool. Well, the other piece of information that came out that supports that is that they found high levels of iodine-131 in that pool. Now, we're 60 days into this accident, and the iodine-131 should be gone. Um, to find high levels of iodine-131 in the Unit 3 pool is, an, is another indication that there was what I had called a prompt moderated criticality. Um, and I believe still that that's just more evidence that supports what I've been saying now for several weeks. Moving on to Unit 4. Unit 4 is leaning. Um, the TEPCO acknowledges that Unit 4 is leaning. Uh, you know, the structure is obviously compromised from the fires and the explosion on Unit 3, but it's tilting at the top, and, uh, and that's not good. If there's a uh, seismic aftershock as a result of the first earthquake, uh, unit, unit 4 could collapse. Um, TEPCO is, is trying dramatically to, uh, to shore up that building, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's tough. It, it's really tough. There's also been some photos released of inside the Unit 4 pool, and the racks appear to have retained their integrity. So the plutonium that we found off-site, and I'll talk about that a little bit here, but the plutonium we found off-site could not have come from Unit 4. The racks are intact. Um, there was enough heat generated on Unit 4 to, um, to burn the building. For two days there was a fire. I wouldn't doubt that um, plutonium and, and other isotopes, cesium and strontium, were volatilized. But I don't think that um, Unit 4 is the source of large quantities of plutonium that have been found off-site. I did some calculations this week, and, um, and I determined that in order for pieces of, of nuclear fuel to be found uh, two kilometers away, and that's um, from an NRC report, the f that those pieces would have to be thrown at around 900 to 1,000 miles per hour um, out of the fuel pool to travel that, that distance. Basically what I assumed is that a piece of fuel about this big um, was, was thrown out of, the nuclear, out of the nuclear fuel pool in Unit 3 and traveled two kilometers. And in order to get that to happen, with air resistance, it had to start out at over a thousand miles an hour. What that means is, again, that confirms what I've been saying all along. That's faster than the speed of sound. That shows there's been a detonation in Unit 3 and not a deflagration. Well, what does all this mean? Um, unit 1's containment is leaking. They can't put nitrogen into it to uh, maintain, its, um, maintain its pressure. Unit 2's has been leaking and filling trenches off-site. Unit 3 is now, uh, is now leaking as well and filling trenches off, um, away from the reactor. Um, so all three nuclear containments are leaking. Now, here in the United States, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has said that it is impossible for a nuclear containment to leak. Um, in the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards in, um, in October of last year, they specifically stated they assume zero probability of containment leakage. Now, obviously that's wrong, and it affects lots of regulations on operating plants, as well as the new Westinghouse AP1000 reactor, which is attempting to be licensed. I'll talk more about that next week. Finally, I want to talk about what does this mean to the off-site vicinity around, uh, around the Fukushima reactor. First, let's talk about the water. As I said, there's a lot of water going in and not all of it's getting captured. Experts have shown that the, um, that the site has sunk by about, um, about a foot. And that indicates that concrete has to have cracked. The concrete foundations have to be cracking 
and that radiation has to be getting into the groundwater. Now in our last video I talked about how radiation had um, had entered the sewage, seat, uh, the sewage system at a, at a local town. Um, a sewage expert contacted me this week and he said it's not uncommon after an earthquake for groundwater to infiltrate a sewage system. So I think the most important uh, thing of information that we need from TEPCO and the Japanese government, and which we have not gotten yet, is what's the con concentration of radioactivity in the groundwater? And finally, airborne radiation. There's a survey out this week from um, the, a combination of uh, American and Japanese overflights that indicate contamination 50 and 60 kilometers away from the reactor. Um, a school, a high school, where, um, where kids are now required to wear masks and long sleeve shirts to protect their skin. And while they're in school, out on the parking lot, they're stripping out the uh, soil because it's so contaminated. If the kids were outside, they'd be exposed to adult nuclear worker levels of concentration. That's unconscionable that that school should be kept open. And finally, all the reactors are continuing to emit radiation. Their containments have failed. So it's going down as water and going up as steam, and there's no plan in, in sight to prevent that from happening in the future. Well, thank you very much, and I'll touch base with you next week.